welcome to Observations. This has uh, been two weeks since we've uh, last done our program. Uh, last week we had dual reasons uh, not to be able to uh, do it, but it's uh, good to be back. We're here with Scott and Kirk. How are you, fellas? Good morning. Good. I'm good. doing well. <laughs> good. I wanted to uh, begin with a um, an email that a friend sent me uh, that showed a picture of what they called floating coffins, and uh, it uh, showed uh, pictures of these uh, uh, Muslim refugees. I think these are uh, trying to get uh, from Libya to Italy. And uh, it shows what could be called a, um, a wooden, it looks like it's wooden, a lifeboat um, that may be yeah, 40 feet long, 35 feet long, something like that. Uh, if it has a propulsion system, you certainly can't tell what it is, and it has no cabin or any uh, superstructure. And there are literally uh, uh, several hundred Muslims in it. Some of them are, are either being pushed into or jumping into the water. And my response when I, uh, I saw this was this, why doesn't anybody ask what is so horrible in their countries that is causing them to be willing to risk their lives to flee, to flee. What is it that's so bad in their country? I mean, it's coming from Libya. It's coming from Iraq, from, uh, from Syria, from Afghanistan, from the uh, Sudan, and from Somalia. What do those countries have going on, and also from Turkey? What do those countries have in common that's causing these people to want to leave? Might be Islam. Okay. Then my next question would be, that being the case, why isn't anyone asking if they're bringing the way of life and the way of dying with them? Do you suppose that these people who are fleeing the hellish conditions in their countries are um, abandoning the religion that caused their countries to be so deadly and so horrible to live in? There's absolutely no evidence of it. I asked the people in Germany or anywhere in Europe and anywhere here. So since, since it was Islam that created the, uh, the hellish conditions, why would we want to bring advocates of Islam into our country? That would be like saying, you know, Ebola caused uh, people to, uh, to die and created really a, a terrible environment to live in Sierra Leone and other countries in West Africa. So maybe the intelligent thing for us to do is let's take people who have Ebola and um, and since they want out of those countries, let's bring them into our country. We are brain dead. That's pretty stupid, isn't it? Now, uh, the next question I have. Why isn't anyone asking why Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Bahrain, Qatar, Jordan, and Iraq, all of which are much closer, even Egypt with the Sinai, all of which are much closer, have an abundance of land, and with all of their oil money, plenty of money, mm -hmm. much closer, I don't plenty that. of uh, of land, uh, and uh, and plenty of money. Why aren't they taking them? They don't want them. Otherwise, they would have taken in the ones that call themselves Palestinians from Jordan, uh, Jordan won't take them back either. Yeah, so so what's going on here? What do they recognize about them that we don't seem to recognize? That maybe they're, they're not productive, maybe they, uh, they, they uh, tend to uh, promote violence, that they're grotesquely immoral, that they're, they're going to be a liability. To their community, you think that if, if the Saudi Arabians looked at the Afghanis, the Syrians, the uh, the Libyans at all as uh, as um, as contributors, as well-educated, moral, hard-working, devoted individuals who are just trying to make a better life for themselves, wouldn't the Saudi Arabians want them? For all, they speak the same language. Yeah. Wouldn't even have to build new new uh, mosques for them. They already got the mosques. Right. Why wouldn't they take them? So why aren't the Saudi Arabians taking them to the Kuwaitis? What do they know that we don't know? 
This has to be the worst of the crowd they're trying to get rid of, and this is either way to either exterminate them or get rid of them. Which one do you? And, and actually use them, the third thing would be to use them to destroy your country. Actually, no, I think that the worst of them mm-hmm. are the ones that are, are, are being the jihadists. They're the, they're the well, best Muslims, and therefore the, the worst people are the ones that want to stay there and, uh, and go play jihad. Yeah. I think most of the people that want to flee are those who don't want to play jihad and don't want to be the victims of uh, of jihad. But so I don't think it's the I don't think it's the worst of them that are trying to escape for the most part. I, I think it's it's probably the best of them. But the best of them, if they're women, have not been educated. If they're men, they've been indoctrinated. Right. And they have no skill sets. There's nothing they can do to contribute to a society. Yeah. And I was thinking about that the other day. Saudi Arabia, and, and because of something you had said years ago, there's, they produce nothing. No, there's nothing. I mean, they, 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 how do well, you manufacture, they, they don't design don't anything, manufacture anything. Or, or yes. nothing. Yeah, if it wasn't for the black ooze that was discovered by others other than them and then developed in terms of extracted by countries other than them right. and then uh, distributed by countries other than them, if it wasn't for the refineries and all of the, the the development that was done by British and American and French companies there that was then confiscated, and you can't say nationalized unless you view Saudi Arabia as a personal fiefdom. Yeah. Uh, That's if, it, yeah, if it wasn't for that, they, they'd be way back in, in every possible way back in the 7th and 8th century um, CE. Well, after 60 years when Saudi Arabia has to sign a contract with China to build a, a new refinery, and that's the only business they have. Right. That's pretty sick. That's pretty sick. Well, yeah, it is pretty sick. great universities, as Obama has told us, and all these great things. Yeah. Yeah. They, 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 they obviously learn nothing but jihad. Obviously. Yeah, it's, it is pretty amazing. Um, then the next question I would uh, ask, why are they coming from all these various countries? Why would they be coming from Afghanistan if we freed the Afghani people? If our mission in Afghanistan was positive, why are an equal number coming from Afghanistan as they're coming from Syria? How can our invasion of Afghanistan been a positive thing if it's produced millions of refugees from Afghanistan? Okay, well, list the positive things that we've done there, and, and I'll build a case on it. Well, I created a hypothetical because we already have. Gone. Oh, we already have. oh, we have. That is true. That's true. So I had to edit that part out. There was too much silence. <laughs> you know, even the fate of women is worse than it was. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's not just that. Uh, that America has made the country worse. It's the most unscrupulous, the most deadbeat, irresponsible, and money laundering, uh, financially abusive government in the world. When it comes to governments ranked by economic fraud, Afghanistan is number one of 225 governments in the world. So not only did we create a, a government that is raping the American taxpayer. But five minutes after we leave, the Taliban will be right back to the position they were with one exception. They're going to have a whole arsenal of okay, weapons was, they didn't previously have. I was about to make the point. We, we've trained their army how to be even more vicious, yeah. and we supplied them with the weapons in order to execute those pretty much the same way we did with most yeah. of the dictators in South America. Right. And anybody that actually sided with us is going to be killed. Sure. And uh, and those that uh, didn't will be f- using those weapons mm-hmm. to oppress uh, people throughout the region. Some will even use those weapons in Israel. Right. And, and we also gave them a central bank, don't forget. Everywhere no. we went, we started with a central bank. Now, you know, if you were to go back five years ago, no. were there boats filled with Libyan refugees trying to get to Europe? Never. In fact, you know, Libya was a pretty decent place to live. They um, had, had probably as good a standard of living as any country in the Islamic world, right up there in the top tier of Islamic countries. 
And what, what is the one difference between Libya now with uh, hun yeah, when they went to holidays to, to Libya. What is the one difference between Libya now and Libya five years ago? It's free of law, no government, no dictator to to stop the jihadist. Yeah, that's the result of what happened five years ago. What happened five years ago to cause those things? Oh, well, we we basically we helped, right? Yeah, we helped. <laughs> <laughs> the global war on terrorism. G W T. If you put, uh, yeah, we 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 helped. We bombed the country into submission. Made sure that the dictator, our uh, our favorite pajama wearing syphilitic, was uh, was killed. And uh, and look what we wrought. And we are so proud of our military. Oh, we have the best military in the world. Look what they did in Libya. Oh, we have the, such a fine military. Look what we did in Iraq. Were there Iraqis fleeing to uh, to Europe when uh, uh, back uh, 15 years ago, before uh, W decided oh, yeah. to invade? And for, and further, were there a million Christians there? There were a million Christians there. You know how many there are now? Zip. <laughs> Zip. Yeah. You know, with allies like us, you really don't need enemies, do you? No, well, I, we're the best country in the world for uh, for making uh, enemies. No one, no one's ever done it better. I mean, we do get something for our military. We we get enemies, we yeah, manufacture yeah. enemies. They're spectacular at it. But just think of that: all the sacrifice, all the money squandered by invading Iraq, and what we did is we turned a country that didn't have a refugee issue at all into an equal supplier of refugees to Syria and Libya and Afghanistan. And a country that may have experienced a terrorist act once or twice a year to now a country that experiences a terrorist act once or twice an hour. A country that's completely and totally broken. It's a, it's a, a country that has a, uh, a Kurd fiefdom in the north that's armed to the hilt with American weapons, which, by the way, the, the American weapons that are that are given to the Turks are being wielded against the American weapons that have been given to the Kurds because they're in all-out war with each other. Mm -hmm. And that was the purpose of the of the Erdogan coup, is that he uh, he uh, being now a dictator, he didn't have to answer to anybody, so he invaded Turkey. Under the proviso, we're going to go after the Islamic State. What did he do? He told the Kurds, you either get the hell out of here, or our tanks are here to kill you. Wasn't it arrogant that, that told us what vehicle he was going to use to uh, to enact all of his plans? Democracy? Mm -hmm. Wasn't that him? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. All right. Mr. Dictator. So here you have all of these uh, refugees that went in, and all the bleeding hearts say, oh, look, look at these are death coffins. You've got to do the right thing. You've got to let them in. Anybody ever ask why there's a million children that have gone missing? Why parents would send their children alone, dispatch them, and why those children, among other Muslims, are enslaved, becoming sex slaves? A million of them. All as a direct result of uh, of our malfeasance. I mean, I, it, it's just stunning that we could be this stupid. It is stunning that we could invade Vietnam, lose 55,000 Americans, and not figure out that we made a bad situation worse because we didn't think of what the consequence was going to be of deposing the government and putting up a puppet government of our choosing, that what would happen once we left? And as a result, we made a bad situation worse. And yet we couldn't learn from that, and we invaded Afghanistan. Same thought, man, we're going to free these people. We're going to show them democracy. And what happened? What a disaster. We can't even get out. And when we finally get out, it's just like Vietnam. You know, Johnson realized, right,
only after uh, you know Kennedy had committed such troops and he had committed Johnson committed more troops and uh, and then uh, it came to light that the Gulf of Tonkin resolution that uh, Johnson had used to uh, get the uh, declaration uh, not of war but of uh, from Congress to send troops in because it was never never anything more than the Vietnam conflict uh, that it had been a complete lie that every aspect of it was a hoax the Gulf of Tonkin incident did not occur. There was no provocation by the North Vietnamese against a uh, U.S. warship, although the U.S. warship was trying to provoke the North Vietnamese. Uh, and, uh, and so when he found that out, there's a recording of him. It's at the University of Virginia archives where Johnson says, now that we know, he's talking to McNamara, the uh, Secretary of Defense. And he's asking McNamara, he says, now that we know that the Gulf of Tonkin incident did not occur and that that was the basis of getting uh, Congress to support uh, um, added troops in uh, Vietnam, the escalation of this conflict. What do we do now? He says, you know, America will never forgive a president that uh, withdraws and defeat. So I can't leave. At that point, a few hundred Americans had died. For his political legacy, Johnson's political legacy, we sacrificed the lives of another 55,000 people. And and yet we couldn't learn from that, and we invaded Afghanistan. And we couldn't learn from that, and we invaded Iraq. And we couldn't learn from that, and we bombed Libya into submission. And we couldn't learn from that, and we tried it in Yemen. And now we're doing the same thing in Syria. And a rallying cry in Syria, Saddam has to go. I mean, uh, Assad has to go. Well, what happened when we, we took out Gaddafi and Saddam Hussein? Sharia law. Sharia law and the imposition of jihadists in, uh, in power. And it's stunning that we we don't learn the lesson. But, you know, I think a lot of it is that mentality. You've probably been following this of the the Kaepernicker. You know, uh, one of my least favorite football players, but Colin Kaepernick. He's out there in uh, in your uh, neck of the woods um, with the San Francisco Forty uh, ers and the the Kaepernicker has taken a knee on uh, on the national anthem. Up to that point, he and I agree. Yeah. I don't do the I don't do the national anthem either. I will find a reason either to go to the restroom or to go to the concession stand, so that I don't get harassed by people for sitting down through it. Because you will be harassed if you don't stand up and put your hand over the heart the national anthem. And I don't do the national anthem. I don't salute the flag. So uh, I uh, I find a reason to leave the stadium. Uh-oh. The Kaepernicker wants to make a display of it, but his he, he originally said that he was doing it because. Uh, African Americans are being uh, murdered by the uh, the police, and uh, and he doesn't want to stand for a country that does that. Black Lives Matter kind of thing. And then he subsequently said, "Well, it's it's uh, police brutality against people of all color." Well, we would agree with it. That mm-hmm. Police in America has become highly militarized, and they're way too vicious. Right. And they're getting away with murder. Tamir Rice. They'll never forget Tamir Rice. That video of that young boy being shot. Is something that is seared into my brain. Drive by, uh, yeah, drive by, by. Uh, a police drive by, and uh, and to have the Justice Department with a mockery exonerate the cop that did the drive by killing of Tamir Rice. I, I will, I will never understand. I will never forgive. Well, he was a big. He's big for his age. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, he was. Yeah, he was probably. Uh, <laughs> Probably the top uh, 20 percentile uh, for uh, for his age, and that was a really uh, menacing-looking uh, uh, toy gun that he was playing with with nobody around him. Yep. And so, to that point, that's just fine. But you know what? What, what bothers me is people's reaction to it. You know, how dare he not honor the flag and and therefore dishonor the servicemen and women who have made this country free? Well, there's not a single serviceman or woman who has made this country free. No American in the military has ever fought for American freedom. Ever. It's one of those patriotic lies. Last I checked, we only had to fight for freedom one time. Well, right? we, we <laughs> and, and, and even then it wasn't a we, two-thirds of Americans. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, uh, we're, we're opposed to, uh, to leaving uh, uh, Britain. And one-third were in favor of it, and... Um, and so that was a revolutionary war to uh, to free the, the colonies, which were British, um, from their British uh, influence. But in that case, there wasn't a U.S. Army. There wasn't a U.S. Navy. 
Uh, Valid point. It's militia. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we're malicious. Uh, and uh, and so you you really can't find a time where the American military fought for American freedom. There is no occurrence where that occurred. Nothing in history. And the American military is the least free institution in this country. But this idea that uh, Kaepernick uh, is going to, and he was booed, uh, and uh, listen, I have no problem booing, A, the 49ers. I grew up in Los Angeles area, so the 49ers are from that, that uh, the land of fruits and nuts up there in Northern California. Sorry, Kurt. Uh, and, uh, okay, okay. And, uh, yeah, you're actually married, and, and to a woman, so uh, yeah, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't like that. How dare you? How dare you? So old of you. What a conformist. Parochial. What a conformist. Such a parochial, yeah. Yeah, you're a conformist, man. That's what they want you to do. <laughs> so, uh, uh, and, uh, and Kaepernick himself, uh, uh, you know, I'm, you know, the, the tattoos from head to toe and now the afro and the attitude and everything else. I, I am not a, Ka- I call it a Kaepernick fan. Uh, but, and, and I'm hugely opposed to Black Lives Matter because it's just become a racist, anti-Semitic uh, organization that uh, is somehow um, misguided into this notion that, uh, that the problem in America is racism and murderous racism of whites against blacks when the Department of Justice statistics um, show exactly the opposite, that if, if a black is killed, murdered in America, nine times out of ten, the perpetrator of the African-American murder is another African-American. And that if, uh, if it's an interracial crime and a black and a white are involved in a murderous incident, that eight times out of ten it's the black who kills the white. Yeah. How dare you put facts in the way of good outrage? <laughs> <laughs> now, to the extent that, um, uh, that the police are militaristic, and that we've lost control of our country and therefore our freedom because our military, just as Jefferson had uh, warned, has, has now uh, been integrated through the, of all things, the Patriot Act so that the police are now an, a, an extension of the federal government and of its military. And that the same spy apparatus are being used, the same weapons are being used, and they're integrated and, and working in harmony together because of the Patriot Act. If his point of view was that that's wrong and I won't stand for the national anthem while that exists I'd have been I'd have been right there with him and that's a that is a valid concern now I would say and this is something that my son brought up when I was with him he said you know we there are no records in America as to how many people cops kill the uh, estimate is anywhere from a thousand to five thousand a year but stunningly there is actually no published record of how many people are killed by, uh, by cops each year, uh, although it's somewhere in, uh, in that particular range. And I would say, all right, I would, I would agree that there is probably a, a uh, disproportionate number of, um, of, of individuals that, um, um, that uh, are, uh, have a, have, are targeted because they are black. And what I would say to that is that, yes, indeed, if, um, if uh, you are an African-American, you should probably be concerned that it is more likely that you're going to be pulled over by a cop than a white person. Sure. But, but why is that? Why is that? Are the cops pulling over black people because black people commit fewer crimes per capita or more crimes per capita? What does the Department of Justice figures present? They verify they do. Yeah, it's it's considerably more crimes per capita. So uh, that's that is the reason. It's it's like um, you know if Muslims don't want to be associated with terrorism, then there's a straightforward solution to that. Um, don't commit 99.9 percent of the world's terrorist acts. Don't be a Muslim. Right. You know, if you don't want someone like Donald Trump saying that we need to screen Muslims to keep our country safe, uh, rather than scream at Donald Trump for how dare you say that, clean up your house. Stop committing 99.9% of the world's terrorist acts. You know, it's pretty straightforward. This is, this is not a difficult stuff to figure out. But I just am 
stunned that nobody seems to um, to want to ask these questions about the boatloads of Muslims that are coming into this country uh, and why uh, these refugee camps for them are not being established in places like uh, Turkey and uh, and Saudi Arabia and in the Sinai Desert of Egypt so that when the U.S. sponsored wars are over, they can just walk back home. But the reason, of course, is that the liberal wants to ch fundamentally change society. They dream of multiculturalism and of doing away with the influence of, uh, of the legacy, really, of Caucasian influence, male influence, um, and um, and Christianity's influence. Now, you know, I'm don't care. Anti-Christian, right? Right, and, and we're anti-Christian on this on this show. But but the influx of Muslims gives them this dream of not only multiculturalism, but a whole group of people that are wholly and completely dependent. So therefore, very easy for them to control. So they um, and you're considered to be a bigot if you don't and embrace them. Yeah, and uh, invite them in. Um, one other thing I wanted to talk about is that um, that scientists have found what they think is the oldest fossil on Earth. Well, that uh, this is CBS News, and of course the journalist is not the sharpest tool in the shed. Scientists would never claim that they think they have found the oldest fossil on Earth. A scientist might say that they have found what is currently the oldest fossil. Uh, uh, of the those oldest. that have been of those that have been found, this is the oldest one. Uh, you know, it's <laughs> they, they usually have to throw a word like the oldest table. known. This yeah, how about that? The oldest, the oldest known. known fossil. Yeah, known would have fixed it. Or of the fossils that have been found, this is the oldest. Or the oldest fossil that has been found thus far. But no, the they think is the oldest fossil on Earth. Now I will guarantee you, they have not found the oldest fossil on Earth. But anyway, that's just where, they be, where the problem begins. A remnant of life from 3.7 billion years ago when Earth's skies were orange and its oceans green. Actually, Earth's skies were uh, opaque. The, uh, in a, in a, the oceans would only have been green if they were filled with uh, algae. Mm -hmm. In a newly uh, melted part of Greenland, now this is uh, um, uh, from an Australian scientist, found uh, the leftover structure of a community of microbes that lived on a uh, ancient seafloor, according to a study in uh, the uh, Journal of Nature. Now, the discovery shows that life may, this is what's just amazing. The discovery shows, now this is this journalist from CBS. Uh, in fact, the journalist's name is, uh, uh, it looks like it's Yuri Amelin. And all Yuri said, the discovery shows that life may have formed quicker and easier than once thought. Easier. <laughs> That it formed quicker and easier. And then he goes on to say that about half a billion years after the uh, the Earth formed. And that may also give hope for life forming elsewhere, such as Mars. Oh, boy. Because it was easier. It says it gives us the idea of how our planet evolved and how life gained a foothold. You know... The fact that they have found proof of life that dates to what was originally about 700 million years after the formation of the planet, uh, now uh, 500 uh, million years, what it did is it proved that the basis of, uh, of evolution was false. You know, evolution, if you do the math on what are the chances of, of, uh, of molecules coming together in such a way that they form a living organism and that that living organism can thrive and nourish itself and reproduce, 
or essentially zero. No. You look at life, and it is so unbelievably complex, so sophisticated. And you have reproduction systems. You have systems for observing, in particular animals, observing the environment and responding to it. Processors, you know, that can process information that is seen and felt and smelled, touched. And you have appendages and systems that will, uh, that will, uh, are able to hunt or, or consume food and then process that food and turn it into energy and then ability to protect itself and then to hunt and they're extraordinary. Uh, systems and of course the it's DNA that that drives this, which is a uh, a three-dimensional um, alphabet and and code of writing. And so the more that we've come to learn about the complexity of life and the order of life, the more we've come to realize that that it is essentially impossible. And so what. As we were going down this path, what the environmentalists did to justify the impossible was to say, okay, yeah, we recognize that it is impossible. And that, that we'll call it, we're going to call it improbable because that sounds better than impossible. But given enough time, billions and billions of years, the improbable becomes not only possible, but probable. But then when they found these first traces of microbial life on Earth at that time now 500 million years after the formation of the planet, when it was extraordinarily hostile to life. And the billions of years were, were constrained. And then they found the Cambridge explosion, which Cambrian explosion, where we found all of a sudden all 26 types of animal life, every phylum was conceived all at the same time, as opposed to slowly and methodically evolving from one from another. Scientific American actually printed a retraction and said that's it's just not true. We don't know the mechanism, and we can't even speculate the mechanism, but the old theory that given enough time, the impossible becomes possible, and, and with billions of years, the improbable becomes probable. That that was a lie. Oh, that it wasn't true. And now here faced with the fact that the time that they thought they had, which was a fraction of what they needed, has been cut in half. <laughs> the <laughs> the Ninkum Poop writing the article said, oh, it just must have been easier. <laughs> oh God, what can we do to uh, deny the Creator? You know, it's like when they found that the scientists were all wrong, that every scientist, essentially, prior to the 1950s, were, found the idea of the universe being created as repugnant to them. And then when Hubble, with the redshift, was able to demonstrate, no, the universe really was created. And the creative event we're going to call the Big Bang, and it turned out to be the same term that Yahweh used. When they found that Yahweh's depiction of what happened was exactly as he said it happened, and that he had said that it happened that way 3,500 years before the scientists had come to the same conclusion, rather than say, well, maybe God was right after all, they said, huh, we don't need God anymore, we figured out how it happened. Yeah, it was created in the Big Bang. <laughs> that's that's what this uh, reminds me of. Yeah, funny. I mean, it really is funny if you think about it. You want funny? Uh, it's funny in a really sick way. You know, uh, I, Jared uh, Fogel, does that name ever ring a bell to you? You remember Jared, Jared Fogel? Subway. Oh. Yeah, Subway. Jared, Jared Fogel. Uh, Subway. You know, and he's a he's a uh, a customer now, a, a client of the uh, of the federal judicial system, uh, some prison, someplace. Oh, really? yeah, yeah, because uh, he was uh, he was uh, he was doing the Muhammad thing, uh, molesting the uh, little children. I'm I'm becoming so grown up. I have jokes, but I'm going to let him go. I'm going to let you uh, tell your story. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I, so you know, this is. Uh, this is not broadcast radio, so you can probably get by with uh, any joke. And, and most of our uh, audience uh, has a uh, little different footlongs now, right? Yeah, different. <laughs> that's right. Well, we're we're assuming that he's uh, that well endowed. 
Uh, but uh, <laughs> none, none, nonetheless, I was talking about the cellmates, but whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, oh okay. By, 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 be true. Um, Mr. Uh, Jared Fogel is actually suing one of his victims' parents. Mm. Actually, suing one of the victims' parents. Evidently, one of his victims' parents, uh, a partner somehow of Fogel, uh, videotaped having sex with a minor. And uh, and somehow Fogel thinks this might have uh, hurt his uh, his reputation. <laughs> just, just, I mean, you can't make this, you can't make this stuff up, right? No. Uh, well, I'm going to uh, we're going to uh, turn to Yasha Yah um, because there there is somebody that is sane out there. Yeah. So this is uh, well, we've uh, we've made it. Uh, uh, somewhere around the 11th statement of the first chapter of Yeshua. And God has just uh, said, listen, uh, my intent was to raise you as my children. I did everything to honor my commitment to do that, but then you resolutely rejected me. And he has uh, said that you know, every aspect of your nature, from your sole of your feet all the way to the top of your head, is uh, uh, sick, uh, totally corrupt. You've, you have absolutely destroyed your capacity to be a moral and rational person. And there's nothing I can do for you. This is what you have done to yourself. And then he, uh, he says here, because he's now uh, attacking their religious customs. And he says, by what means can I be approached through the great multitude and exalted aspects of your sacrifices? Asked Yahweh. I have literally and actually fulfilled, satisfied, and completed the uplifting offering to rise of the male lamps. In addition, the lipid tissue of overfed fatlings and the blood of bulls, lambs, and goats, I do not want or desire. Now, what does that mean to you, guys? It means he doesn't want it. The sacrifices were made also for our benefit because they ate them. Food is a celebration. Right. Feast. Yeah. So we don't. We're not sacrificing anything. In fact, that's why the that's why the term sacrifice is just so odd here. It's it's appropriate if you look at what Yahweh did for us. It's completely inappropriate to what we are doing, because we aren't sacrificing anything. Now, the the animal. I know. I don't even think he he can have been a sacrifice there. You know, is do we think of it when a uh, a coyote uh, chases down a rabbit? And uh, and feeds it to its pups. Do we uh, do we say that that uh, coyote sacrificed the rabbit, or do we say that they even we would we believe that the rabbit was sacrificed for the uh, the well-being of the cubs? We don't even we don't ever say that. No, the pups. No, it, it's sacrifice is just such an odd term. term for that. Yeah. And uh, in in all of this. I don't have a problem, sacrificial lamb, if you're projecting, if you're using it symbolically and you're projecting on what Yahweh did in the form of Yosha in terms of becoming the sacrificial lamb for our benefit on Pesach so we might live. But this idea that man is sacrificing, you know, dig deep, you know, God loves a cheerful giver, God, God must really be broke because he is looking for money. You can't, obviously can't help the preachers if we don't help them. So this notion that uh, that the great multitude exalted aspects of our sacrifices, God saying, you, what makes you think you could approach me that way? You can't. And then the, you know that's, there's so much. Um, said about blood sacrifices, and you know, and, and, you know, I even had somebody write me the other day, you know. You know what about blood sacrifice? So, uh, if the uh, if, 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 if the New Testament is invalid, how do you resolve sin without blood sacrifice? And so, yeah, the the answer for that is really long and, and cumbersome. You know, when uh, I've just been translating the most amazing story, I think that's in the entirety of the uh, of the Torah. It's the seventh meeting between uh, Yahweh and Abraham and Yishak. And it's interesting that one of the things that comes up is, uh, is Yishak says, Hey, Dad, you know, we've got the wooden planks here to build the altar, and we've got the fire, you know, to, to do the big uh, uh, cookout. 
There's the lamp. Said, but where's the lamp? And the first thing he said, wait a minute. Why would, why would he even ask about a lamb? You know, they, Dad came from Ur. You know what they sacrificed in Ur? It's the same thing they said. People. People. Their own children. We have now dug up the largest uh, ancient graveyard in, uh, in Ur. The only one we've found thus far, uh, it's a series of them actually, but all of which date back to the time Abraham left. Really? Ur. Mm-hmm. And we found thousands upon thousands upon thousands of corpses in these uh, graveyards. They're all part of, of uh, elaborate royal homes and as part of, uh, of priestly shrines and buildings. And you know what, what all of those people that are in those graveyards have in common? Are there children? Nope. Oh, there are some children. Equal number of men and women. Well, maybe they're all bound up, tied up? Nope. They all died exactly the same way. Well, not exactly the same way. The men had two one-inch spikes drilled into their heads. The women had one. Human sacrifice by the thousands upon thousands Every single victim had a one-inch or two one-inch holes drilled into their skull. And those protrusions into their skull all occurred while they were still alive. It wasn't some after-the-fact ritual. And then after having one or, can imagine the pain, of a one or, uh, one or two one-inch uh, Holes being drilled into your head. Then they were uh, they were uh, put in an oven, not to cremate them, not to burn them, just to bake them, to dry the water moisture out of them. And then they were uh, coated, uh, sprinkled with a extract of mercury. You know why? Uh. Preserve them or something for yeah exactly they wanted they wanted to preserve them long enough for them to be paraded and shown around the town uh, at the religious uh, shrines a to tell people you know if you step out of line this will be you mm-hmm. and uh, b to uh, to show to uh, show them to their gods to appease their gods so when Yishak says where's the lamb as opposed to you know, we left the, the two uh, lads down there at the base of the hill. Why didn't you bring them up, Dad, if we're going to have a, a sacrifice? Now, the very fact he mentioned lamb means that he was aware of the Torah. But that's what, when you're talking about the grand approaches of the, the, the these exalted aspects of, of sacrifice, I then did a study to find out, so which cultures sacrificed humans? And the answer is all of them. I can't think of any. Did the you? Japanese, the Chinese were prolific. The Mongolians were prolific. The Carthaginians, the Romans, and uh, uh, until around uh, 100 BCE, uh, had it as part of their national culture to sacrifice people to their gods, and then afterwards they just uh, did it for their entertainment and their uh, in their coliseums and amphitheaters. Yeah. Uh, the Greeks, they just found uh, very large uh, grave sites in Greece where children had been sacrificed to the gods. And, of course, there was the Aztecs, the Mayans, the Incas. Uh, the Druids were prolific at sacrificing humans to their gods. That's the kind of, uh, and, and God is saying, you know, I am repulsed. I mean, he just said, you are sick. Your brain has I mean, menstrual yeah, cramps. I mean, yeah, you are just sick. Why is it you think you can approach me doing this kind of stuff? I would ask you, too. This was uh, uh, a uh, Yashaya. The beginning of Yashaya was written in um, 745 BCE, 777 years before uh, the most important part of it was fulfilled by Yosha. And... Um, 745 BCE, did, did Judaism exist? No, no, not at all. No. 
In fact, did Judaism, uh, uh, do they honor Asherah? Um, no. They don't. No, they don't. Well, no. No, no, they don't. Uh, Astarte, Asherah, they, they don't uh, honor uh, Astarte, Asherah. Yeah, and they, do they, um, uh, in Judaism, do they, uh, they have a queen of heaven, mother of God? No. Uh-uh. And those were the specifics. They just twist the tour. I mean. Yeah, that was the specifics of uh, of the religion that was being practiced. Right. And so that was the Babylonian religion, wasn't it? Right. What religion today is most like the Babylonian religion? Roman Catholicism. Yeah, it be it. And Christianity, uh, Protestant Christianity, differs right. only by 5 to 10%. Right. It's Roman Catholicism like oh, yeah. Catholicism. Yeah. Except... It has some some flaws that are, I think, worse than Roman Catholicism. You know, like uh, the Pentecostal movement of pretending to speak in tongues, Mm -hmm. I think, is worse than uh, Roman Catholicism. This notion that uh, they would never make in Roman Catholicism, they they know better, that they'll hold up their uh, uh, Protestant Christians, Baptists, for example, will hold up their New Testament saying this is the inerrant word of God. A Roman Catholic won't do that. They don't even care. Roman Catholicism, they, right. you know, this is the Pope says, or we've said, and that's... All right. So they're they're both horrible, and they're both Babylonian, and I'm not sure that there is really one better than the other. Uh, so then the next thing is that uh, blood sacrifice. When God says, I don't want your damn blood. I don't want any animal's blood. As a matter of fact, what does he say to do with blood? When you kill an animal, what does Yahweh say? Uh, pour, you don't eat it. Pour it out in the ground, right? Yeah. You certainly don't even ingest it. Right. No. You know, the Roman Catholics in their Eucharist claim that their priests turn wine into the blood of their God. Mm-hmm. And then they drink it. Right. What do you always say about drinking blood? That's right out of Babylon. Huh? Right. See, by the way, they say that the Roman Catholic Church is therefore more miraculous than God himself. Because God couldn't do that. He could turn water into wine, but they turned wine into blood. Good point. By the way, do you think they've ever had anybody test their miracle? Uh, I don't think it's going to happen. <laughs> That's why they have yeah. the, the different view. Yeah. They're up there and we're down. Yeah. Now, when Yahweh says that uh, I have literally and actually fulfilled, satisfied, and completed Shabbat, I have genuinely, once and for all, honored my obligation to do as promised, and I have fulfilled uh, to uh, my complete and, t- and total satisfaction, this was written in the call, Perfect Active, the uplifting offerings to rise, the Ola of the male lambs. How could he have said that in uh, 745 BCE when it would be 777 years? I don't know. I think that's probably just a coincidence, the three sevens there. Yeah. Uh, but uh, sure. to, uh, to 33 CE, year 4000, yeah, when he fulfilled that, we're 777 years away from the field, but how in the world can he be so presumptuous to say, I've already done that? He's not set in time. Simple. Yeah, yeah it is. It's as and simple as that. Is today is, is forever. You know, yeah, past, it's, present. He can, go in, he can go in any direction. Particularly as it relates to oh, his right. view of our three-and-a-half-dimensional world right. from, this, from seven dimensions. Right. And this whole thing is played out before his eyes. Now, I don't want to talk about telling you that every aspect of it has, because every aspect, if if every aspect of everything that was going to happen had played out and he had witnessed it, what fun would it be? I mean, the whole experiment to create a being that you could fellowship with and enjoy their company would be a complete waste if it wasn't for for an ongoing sense of chaos, for for, uh, not, you know, choosing deliberately not to know everything that was going to, uh, to happen. But in terms of the big picture things, yeah. Uh, those, yeah, it's already, yeah, he's, he's already done them. His, his objective is to create a family, and in, in creating a family, uh, he's going to provide sources for them to respond to. So he, that part he has to organize ahead of time and know. Yeah, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the word um, uh, Ola, that was the, I translate as uplifting offering uh, to rise. Ola. Do you know what it's based on? It's a it's a noun. It's based on a verb. Do you know what the verb is? Allah. Allah. And the verb Allah means to ascend. Oh, Allah, Allah, yes, yes, yeah. okay. To ascend, to go up, and to rise up. 
And you know how different uh, Ola and Allah are as they appear in the uh, the original Hebrew text? I, I'm going to speculate there's none. None. Absolutely none. Now, so this idea that an, uh, a, um, an Ola is a burnt offering made by fire, there's nothing associated with burnt. There's nothing uh, associated uh, uh, by fire in the word. The word simply means to rise. That's all it means, to rise. Now, what's interesting here is that it is written, Ain Yad Lament. Excuse me, LF. I, I said, said Ain. I, I mean, it's LF. LF Yad Lament. Uh, LF is the, uh, is the uh, ram's head that uh, is the first of the two letters in the two favorite titles of Yahweh. Uh, one is El, as in Elohim. God, yeah, El, Elohim, Eloah, Almighty God. Uh, and that one is, uh, is the ram's head as the leader, the protector of the flock, and the uh, the upside down, if you will, right side up from God's point of view, mm-hmm. a shepherd's staff. Right. The shepherd uh, rescuing, helping uh, his uh, sheep as one of his sheep. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's L, as an almighty God. And then in the, the case of father, which is the first word in every Hebrew lexicon, that's uh, LF, they F. Um, it is. Uh, it has that same ram, the protector, the leader of the flock, and a drawing of a home. Mm-hmm. And so it's the head of the household, father. Now, in this particular case, you start with the uh, LF. So this is the father, almighty God, mm-hmm. the leader of the flock. And then a, uh, a yod. Which is a the, hand, yeah. down, lift is up, sure. Right. The very hand of God. Followed by a lament, a shepherd's staff. I would view that as a rescue element. Yeah. Pay the sheep, All right. the children. Yeah, leadership. I'm going to lead you, which means I'm going to direct you, I'm going to instruct mm-hmm. you. Right. I'm going to guide you. I'm going to save you. I'm going to protect you. I'm going to nourish you. I'm going to walk with you. And uh, so those are the three letters. It's, it's, uh, this A-L is, is pretty extraordinary. You know what? That A-L has uh, two meanings in Hebrew, too. This, uh, this uplifting offering uh, to rise of the male lamb. You know what the, uh, the secondary meaning is after you get uh, past male lamb, uh, the next meaning of A-L? No. What, is, what did the sacrificial lamb of Yahweh do? On, on, upon what was he affixed? And what did he open? Oh, well, he, he was affixed on a pole, upright pole. Which was? Which would support the uh, tent, the home. Yeah, okay, but... And he makes you stand okay. upright. What, what, where was the blood sprinkled during the, uh, the Exodus? The uh, Ark of the Covenant. No. Where was the blood sprinkled to initiate the Exodus on the first Passover? On the doorpost. Well, on the doorpost. On the doorpost. Of course. What is that the doorway to? Doorway to his home. All right. The doorway to life. And, and that is where the, uh, the blood of the sacrificial lamb was sprinkled, was on the doorway to life, which is Passover. Mm-hmm. The, um, the definition of A.L. is doorposts. Oh. Amazing, isn't it? Yes. He is the, this lamb is the doorway to God's home. So there's a lot we can learn when we just take the time to consider um, all of this. But one of the things you have to recognize is that God is saying, listen, I, I cannot be approached by human sacrifices. Your sacrifices disgust me. You are not going to get into my presence. I don't even know what makes you think that you can get into my presence with your sacrifices, you know, your donations in today's world. You can't even endure it. Right, and then he says, "You know, I'm the one. I, I'm the one. I made the sacrifice. I fulfilled it. I satisfied. I completed it." As it relates to the uplifting offering to rise of the male uh, lambs, forming the doorway to my home. But you have to know when one sentence ends and the next one begins. 
Then he says, because if you strive to approach, to see my presence, who or what was it that sought this beggary from your hand? thereby treading on my on the blowing of my trumpets in my court. We talked about this during our last program on uh, the Shabbat program, that uh, if you look at where Yahweh speaks of trumpets pre- pertaining to his court, they were uh, blown before the Ark of the Covenant, which represents his covenant family, and they were born uh, blown to specifically announce the arrival of the Mikre. Oh, Mikre, yeah. So when you're trampling on those trumpets, what you're doing is you're silencing the message. Yahweh's call to approach, his invitation to approach via the mikra, and that's what they were trampling upon. And that is what, what you know, when Christians do their gift giving, where they're making a sacrifice for the others, gift giving of Christmas. And uh, they celebrate Easter, they're trampling on Yahweh's mikra. Yeah. It's not just that Easter and Christmas are pagan. It's that they're direct counterfeits and they travel on that. Which is, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly, exactly right. Pagan replacements. And, and by replacing what Yahweh has offered, they're extraordinarily destructive. That's why God hates them so much. You know, if, if man's religions had just said, listen, we don't much like the, uh, the real God. And we want to reject everything the real God stands for. And we're going to create our own God. And uh, with this own God, we're going to have our own set of uh, beliefs, our own festivals, our own explanations. And we're not going to, like Islam and Christianity, we're not going to mention Abraham. We're not going to mention Adam. We're not going to mention Noah. We're not going to mention Doe David. We're not going to pretend that this is the same God and, and that uh, we're just coming up with our variations of how we want to, uh, to corrupt that message to, to serve our interests. If they had said, you know, we're just going to create something entirely different. We're not going to even, even hint that it's the same God. That would be one thing. But what God despises so much is that man's religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, all claim his credibility and all not only corrupt and counterfeit what he is teaching and offering, they place their rubbish right on top of the most important events in human history. Well, that kind of leads to the question I, I had that I was, mm-hmm. at the end of 13, right? 13, 113, mm-hmm. you've got a sorrow at sorrow, and we know that's a religious binding, we know it's a... Um, it's also a uh, family for Baal and so forth. So if can, you yeah, can, I, can I read, may read 13 and then, uh, let's see, yeah, let me just read 13 and then, and then, yeah, go ahead from there. You should not increasingly and habitually come, continuing to bring devastatingly worthless, completely invalid, and deceptively futile tributes, gifts, and offerings. Incense is a detestable abomination to me. I cannot comprehend, I cannot endure, I cannot overcome. The deceptive and disastrous falsifications associated with your oppressive and lifeless religious assemblies, which hinder and withhold the benefits of the time of renewal and the Shabbat, the calling out of the Mikra invitation to be called out and meet. Yeah. Well, the last last couple of words on there, mm-hmm. um, you know, when you have Lo, Yakol, Lawan, and Sarah. If you look those up, and if you're mm-hmm. even a two-bit translator like me, you can look it up, and you know he's not talking about the Moed Mikri. These are religious binding things. They're the they're assembly for Baal, according to Amos, and then later in uh, Jeremiah's assembly of deceivers. All these assemblies are, are restricted to religious things. That's the way you translated it, and that's what I found everywhere. And that brought me a little sad thought. I was thinking. Yeah, and, and by the way, it's pretty obvious since the previous statement calls them your st- your variations, and this time it doesn't have. It says you. It talks about your corruptions, mm-hmm. but the uh, the mikre and the shabbat are now Yahweh's. Yeah. Uh, Scott, is it possible we could just go a little longer, or are we uh, we dead, dead on time? Yeah, at this point? we can go. Okay. We can go let's just let's just go. Let's get uh, Kirk to uh, have a chance to. F- finish his, his thought here. Thank you, Scott. Well, uh, well, 
while I was on holiday, I, I, I did a little bit of reading and besides just painting, and I looked up, I have a 26 verse, um, 26 different um, Christian Bible collection. Okay. And everywhere you look in there, it always talks about this, these assemblies as if they're not talking about the same one, but they're talking about some Jewish deal. Uh -huh. And they're talking about the Moed Mikri, and, and they try to bang your, hit you over the head with it, saying that, well, this is those things that he doesn't like. Now, he could, yeah. hardly, say that, he could hardly say that, because he said over and over and over again, he's declared them as the pathway home. They were the followers of the way. I mean, you can rationally think this through and go, even if you didn't know the words, you could say, that cannot be. And if you look right. at the words, you know it's not. Right. So even though we've, we've hit this idea before, when you look at Christianity or rabbinical Judaism later, mm -hmm. they all declare, and mostly, or at least the Christian, Christians do, they all declare based on these verses that Yah hates these things, and we know that he absolutely doesn't change his Shabbat, and he doesn't change his Moed Mechrit. That's a given. Mm -hmm. What I don't understand is when, oh, I do, but just to put it out there, Christianity, um, through Paul, they right. gave this substitute religion, this binding religion, and then they attack the Jews and the Yehudims as somehow they're inferior people, inferior thought and so forth. But then they go and grasp all these ideas to make their religion. Mm -hmm. And everything that's, if you read it, it is so genius that if there was no God, if you, even if you accept the idea there's no God, mm -hmm. no known God at least, mm -hmm. then these people have got to be the most brilliant people that ever walked the face of the earth. Yeah. Because this, this what Yahweh said that they recorded, if it's attributed to them as no right. God, or it's attributed to them to whatever, yes, it is just they're brilliant. Yes. Yeah, so how is it that that uh, the that this testimony that yeah. is brought to us by these uh, these people through uh, through Yahweh and his prophets, yeah. how could it be so stunningly accurate in terms of future history yeah, and of world history right, and of and past history? Yeah, yeah, and of Right, and of science, and just so brilliantly pre uh, presented. Yeah, these sheep herders. Right, and, and and particularly when um, these prophets through Yahweh you are know, saying, you know, you are so stupid, it hurts. <laughs> you are just so stupid. I mean, it's just it's painful. I can't endure it anymore. Yeah. Uh, you have to be stupid. Yeah. So I how mean, would a sheep herder like Moshe? Uh, 3,500 years ago, come up with the precise order and the precise time and then the precise way that the universe was created exactly uh, uh, 3,500 years before scientists figured it out. Yeah, and if you got that out of Egypt study, then it would be an Egypt study. We'd find that too. He didn't get it there. No, of course I not. I mean, no, the Egyptian yeah, hieroglyphs yeah. have a have an entirely, I mean, I mean, I mean absolutely no correlation uh, between any of this. As a matter of fact, in, in the Egyptian uh, religion, uh, and there was no Egyptian science, there was the Egyptian religion, which was integrated into the Egyptian governance and uh, also Egyptian militarism. Right. The sun and moon were gods. You know, it was the it was the various gods having human characteristics that were fighting amongst themselves that uh, that created uh, aspects of the uh, the universe. I mean, no, it's their yeah. recordings are are the antithesis of what we read. So are the Babylonian recordings. The Sumerian. Well, these people then become the most creative people in the world. Yeah, and you're putting them down. Uh huh. And you're going, what have you created? You can't even come up with your own dead gum religion. Right. Yeah, it's just amazing, is that, and that all that time. In fact, even the uh, Paul, who was the founder of the Christian religion, he was a Jew. Yeah, <laughs> he was one of them. And beyond, <laughs> beyond that, he he he, 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 he wasn't smart to come into religion. He he just twisted and bastardized the the uh, the teachings of Yahweh, and then used his bastardization of them to condemn the teachings of Yahweh. Yeah. And you know, in Islam, it's a blending together of Judaism and Christianity, and uh, and, remember and he, yeah, right. Hanif paganism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they couldn't create a Muhammad couldn't and his his pocket pal uh, Allah. They couldn't create a religion either. Not, not, you should be embarrassed, right? As a matter of fact, 
since the the uh, the Trinity right. and the uh, the God the Father, uh, God the uh, the Son, and the uh, and the Mother of God, Queen of Heaven, was created in Babylon. And since they uh, came up with the idea of that uh, dying and resurrected uh, God uh, celebrated on Easter uh, and uh, and the winter solstice, December 25th. What's changed? Nothing. They, they haven't added one. Or... No, they haven't added anything. They haven't taken anything away. They haven't added anything. So <laughs> once you get blood sacrificing the people, you don't care. It's same, same religion. And you, you feel, so why is it that this Torah and the prophets and Psalms are so brilliant, so accurate, so marvelous, and uh, and ever since then you've, you've, you've been able to do nothing independently on your own? And 100% of your credibility, you've, just, you've usurped by falsely claiming to attribute your religious mumbo-jumbo to the real God. <laughs> I, you know, I, I know it's rhetorical to us. It's dumbfounding, isn't it? And, and, but it's, it's like you ask, those, you ask those questions to yourself and you say, how, do you, how did they get there from here? And, and people flop. Believe it. I believe it. Believe yeah, it's a, a person down there in uh, Republican South Africa, uh, Clement, has just uh, sent a number of emails. And, and on he is, uh, he said, you know, how in the world was it that I was fooled? Yeah. And why are so many people fooled? I mean, it's just this is so obvious. And, uh, and he's a newbie. I mean, he's just come to the realization. And that's the question we all ask. I mean, our first question was, how in the world? Actually, the first question is you're, you're uh, disappointed. Yeah. That people you trusted, you believed, deliberately fooled you. That's your first. And then your second reaction is you're just thrilled by uh, how marvelous the truth is compared to the uh, the lie of religion. And then somewhere along the way you start sharing what you've right. learned, Yahweh's testimony, and they mock God's testimony and become disgusted by them. Yeah. But, uh, you know, all in all, you finally come to a position where it becomes impossible to have any empathy for them. You know, you, you begin to see the religious as deliberately, wantingly, willingly ignorant and irrational. Because why yeah. would you believe it? And that's, that's a hard thing to come to early. I mean, I've been, I did a long time ago, so it's much now I just uh, in total agreement. And just, yeah. It's the thing yeah. Just I am, uh, I, I, having witnessed Yah was attempt to awaken his children. Yahshua, Yah, for example, is a great example. Hosha is a great example of Yahweh trying to awaken his children um, to the truth and, and to introduce them to who he is. And then Yosha's uh, attempt to do the same. And the fact that uh, they uh, were successful to the extent about one person out of uh, out of every one million. Uh, and you know they're they're even smarter than you are, Kirk. <laughs> and uh, and they uh, were to the point of almost universal failure in terms of being able to offer people the greatest gift in the universe uh, and presenting it in an irrefutable way with absolute unequivocal evidence. Yeah. And uh, and yet they failed almost a million times for every success. I uh, I don't have very high expectations. No, for, I, I for mean, even no matter how, yeah. Uh, this and they, yeah. Well, when they read these things, but uh, there's your answer. They just yeah. won't get it. They won't get it. Yeah, I know it's, it, has, it may be Nisama related and so forth, but I tell you, it just so it is so logical. Yes, it is so logical, it, and it's so beautiful what he's offering. With a different conclusion. That's why God is saying, you know, I uh, I cannot comprehend. Yeah. I cannot endure, and I cannot resolve. The corruption so that of religion. Is, that is a uh, a sobering thing for somebody for God Almighty. Yeah. So yeah. Can, Having uh, studied for the last fifteen years every day his testimony, I will guarantee you he is really smart. If he can't comprehend it, and I will tell you, when you realize that he not only put up with Dove but loved him, yeah. and he puts up with me and loves me, yeah. that he is extraordinarily uh, willing to endure a lot of stuff. And for him to say, I can't comprehend it, I can't endure it. And then when you think of the magnificence of his power and plan, and he says, I can't resolve it, that's really bad. Yeah. Uh, it's, 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 um... Now, I will agree with him. I can't comprehend religion either. I can't endure it either. 
And as for darn sure, I don't have the wherewithal to resolve the problem of religion. No, it's like uh, politics and religion. You can't solve it. Can't solve it. It, it, has, a, it has a course, and it's, and it's going to go down that path. And those who believe in, in either of them um, can't be reached, can't be helped. No. God does not have a plan to save the religious or the political. Well, and, and the point you make often is, is if he could save the religious in a, in a way that they could hold on to their thoughts, why do you want them there? Why would you want them in? Yeah, why would you want them yeah, they bring that to... bring just corrupted right. the way they corrupted everything else. It'll I'm looking forward to Eden being exactly like Eden was. Yeah. Yeah. No religion. Right. Apologies. Just you, just Yahweh and, uh, and, and fellowship and exploring and considering what he has created. Yeah. All right, fellas. Well, thank you. Thank you, Scott, for letting us go long. Yes, sir. Yeah, not a problem at all. We appreciate it.